So this is what we are going to do. I'm going to at least start so that we can get you guys going and then I will upload the PowerPoints as we're going so that you guys can have them as well. And then um, we'll go from there. So if you have questions, just stop me. But this first half of the class, we're at least going to just kind of go over what I went over last week, not just for California, but for the whole United States, if that makes sense. Hopefully that makes sense. So just so that we can get things rolling for some reason why, I don't know why it's not letting me screen share, but just as I mentioned briefly last week, real estate is different in every state. Every state has different requirements, but they all branch from the same fundamental figures, right? So kind of mentioned it last week, it's just California does it differently. There are two types of property tangible, which is physical. You can touch it, you can rub it, you can step on it. And then you have intangible, which are things that you can't actually touch. You know you own them, but you can't actually touch them. So that'll be like the mortgage, a lease on a rental property that you have. But it's something that shows proof of ownership. Right, so that's also considered parts of real estate. And then when you have it as an object that you can actually touch, a tangible asset, you can have it three different ways. You can have it as raw, which is just the actual land. It's just dirt. You know, you have sewer lines and water lines and gas lines underneath, but you still haven't put anything on it, right? It could be a road. It can have a driveway already. You can have the structure, which is a house, a building, or anything on that land as well. And you can have it as what we call a bundle of rights, like I mentioned last week, where you own the gas, the water, the minerals, the well, the oil, and you can use that to generate money. And then you can you know, lease the property as well, which is called disposition. And dirt slash land is only valuable if you actually put it to use. If you aren't using it for anything of value, it's just sitting there, it's wasting away. Then you have my aspect of it, which is the actual industry and profession, which includes development, property management, real estate law, appraisal, planning, government regulation, assistance, mortgage financing. So what a lot of people don't realize are there every time a home is sold, there's about 30 to 40 jobs that are actually needed to make sure that a home actually closes. So it's a very, very active and necessary industry, no matter where you are. And real estate is responsible for about half of the wealth in the entire world. And just here in the United States, it generates over 25% of our gross domestic product. That's the whole industry. But the housing aspect itself is responsible for 17 to 18%. And 20% of your local government, like your counties and your cities, creates about 20% of their revenue from property taxes. So it creates jobs for about 9 million people here in the United States. And what we found here is our problem is we have issues with the land itself. So as you can see, over the last 30 something years between 1918, 1980 and 2015, we used a lot more land to build because there's more people, people are living longer, you know, people have families. The average family size in the 80s was about a family of four, right? Spouses and two kids, now that's a little bit higher. So we need more. So we have more people, which means we need more farming, which 
and tail is trying to find ways to grow farming land. So we have to have that capability of making sure that that is available for everybody, right? Develop land, which is land that we have housing on, is responsible for 6% of the land in the whole United States. So not only is that a small percentage, but we still need to have capabilities of having everything else. Right? So now if you look at these, this is all different types of real estate and market values of things. Real estate is responsible for, in 2018, it is now up to 38.5% of all revenue brought into the United States. And that is a, a large amount of money. So real estate is a definite need and a necessity. The income that it provides and the opportunities it provides are huge for this country. So we have to make sure that that is consistently coming in. We have to make sure that it is regulated. We have to make sure that it is doing what it's supposed to do. And in 2018, 20, about 21% of the actual wealth or assets of the United States for families was in their home, right? Not in their bank accounts, not in their stocks, not in their retirements, not in their pension, not in their mortgage, but in their home. So in 2018, it was about $26 trillion was just created of wealth from owning a home, right? Whereas the mortgages was only 60%. So that means that 40% equity just from 2018, and that's not counting the rise of home prices in the United States over the last two and a half years since the pandemic has started. We, we have more Americans who are making, who are becoming wealthier through the sales of their homes while also not having much debt. So the balance is there. So you see where the opportunities are able to actually come in, which is what everyone wants. Everyone wants that opportunity to gain wealth. But the problem is, if everybody's looking at the same way of gaining wealth, how is it that everyone can have that same opportunity? So you can see the potential for a discrepancy in that moment, or in this moment to this day. So now, your percentage in 2018 is about 60% if you owned a home. Now it's probably close to like 90 or 100 because home prices have almost gone up 75% all over the United States in the last two and a half years. So you have large amounts of opportunity for people to gain wealth, but not everyone can get a home because there's, you know, a need for more but people are struggling to find that or find it affordable for them and right now like i said 25 percent of everyone's total assets are in their real estate so we just have to be aware of that we have to notice how that can change and go up in the next few years and there are three things that actually determine the value of your real estate, right? And it is determined by the interactions of supply and demand in three different areas. First one is the property market, right? Which is the actual physical homes itself. Capital markets, which is the actual rate, you know, the mortgage rates that are coming by and what is determining things, as well as space. So where can we put more homes? If we're running out of space, that means it's going to become even more expensive, even more of a harder commodity to come by because there's nowhere to put anything. Right, 
So you have, when you purchase a home here, you have a market for the physical real estate. You know, bedrooms, baths, that type of stuff. But when you own that, you also own the right to use what we call space, which is the opportunity to either rent that home out or if someone kind of gets too close when you're flying over a plane, you have the opportunity to, you know, send out a fine for that. The space market also determines what the rental rates are. Very competitive market. And prices vary by area. Right. And you can separate from retail, office industry, that's all the commercial side. And then the residential side, as we call it, is just like your normal rent. Like you would you would pay rent on a home. Excuse me one second and grab some water. Sorry about that, guys. So with the incident of space, it allows us to determine what is pricier or what is harder to come by, right? Because when you have retail space, that's where your stores are. Any type of, you know, clothing, grocery stores, um, restaurants, and then you have office space, which is where, you know, business is held, industrial, warehouses, things like that. So having a certain amount of space is very, very important. And knowing exactly what the average is compared to, you know, location, you know, what you're nearby, freeways, other businesses, ports for, you know, import, export, wherever you are, all of those types of factors actually determine the price on the market. So we have to be aware of that, you know, if we price too low, people get a little bit sketchy. If you price too high, people are going to stay away. So we have to have the right timing and be in the right, right, you know, price range so that people can actually create their own form of competition and bring up price. Because what we want is we want to price it at the point where people feel like it's a steal and they're willing to pay more for it. But we don't want to price it at the fact where it's too low and you don't get much competition or you price it too high where the competition is trying to bring it down. So you have to be able to tell that line and be able to recognize that. So just like in economics, just like anywhere else you go, the fundamental way to fluctuate price is supply and demand, right? Demand side are us individuals, household firms, businesses, who need the space to either produce, consume, or just to live. And then you have supply side is who owns the space. So just like we have our, you know, our wants and needs, there's still wants and needs on the people that are providing us for what we need. So not only do we as consumers have to think about our need, we also have to, think in the back of our heads, do the people that provide what we need have the availability to give us what they need? Do they have the space? Do they have the opportunity? Where is the closest grocery store? Where is the closest gas station? All those types of things we have to be aware of as well, because not only is it convenient for us, 
but it also has to be at the spot where it's available to them so that it can be convenient to us, if that makes sense. So now that we have established where we can find, right, the process of them finding what they need, now these things have to be divided so that it is understandably aware for where it is for us, right? And what I mean by that is dividing it into into specific segments allows us to understand where we need to go to get certain things because my needs and wants may be different than anybody else's your needs and wants are different so you need to know what markets what areas are you going to be in to get what you need for daily living or whatever it may be so both demand and supply side are very specific to location and building type. The normal consumer, you know, the ones who just need necessities, groceries, things like that, don't really need to go to a warehouse unless they're going to buy in bulk. But we could also buy in bulk from a store. More often than not, we're not going to need to go to a warehouse. So we don't need to know where a warehouse is, if that makes sense. Now, if we're a business, more often than not we need to know where warehouse is right you know for a lot of us our families aren't big so we're not looking to buy in bulk unless we're just trying to avoid going to the store but we also have to recognize between us that we all like different things we all need different things we need food but Within food, you have a different type of thing. You have those that eat anything. You have vegetarians. You have vegans. You have pescatarians, right? You have paleo. You have keto. You have gluten-free. That's just within eating. And that's not even within purchasing gas, for example, right? You have those that need diesel. You have those that need premium. You have those that need unleaded. So you have all of these various differences and sometimes they're all not able to be found in the same place. So we have to be aware of that. We have to acknowledge that. We have to keep that in mind when it comes to availability. And that's also the responsibility of the business we're purchasing from. It is their responsibility to make us aware of what's where it's supposed to be is in their best optimal place to grow their business to get their products to their consumers that need it so all of these things that come to mind for a business owner are things that sometimes naturally expects us to keep in mind but we don't really think about it all the time so we just know where things are we don't think about accessibility unless we really need it until we really need things we don't think about accessibility right so because of our various needs and necessities and all of these types of things right prices for everything can be different everywhere we go right space and very widely location property types like we mentioned when you look at property types right rental fees usually are flat rate per month which is understandable now, if we go to industrial, retail, and other types of commercial property, it's usually a price per square foot, which is a huge difference. So normally you might see like $1.50 a square foot. If the property is 300 square feet, that's $450 a month. Now, if it's 1,000 square feet, that's 1,500 a month. So you have 
different ways of pricing that are available to those that need it. So we have to realize that everything is different when it comes to each aspect of real estate. When you purchase a home or the land, there's a price that's advertised and you can choose to negotiate up or down, right? Most people don't actually contest with the price per square foot. They just are willing to pay it. And then you have capital markets where real estate competes for funds with other things, right? So you're competing for money. And what we mean by that is how do you know when real estate is competing for money we're trying to see if there is bidding which allows to affect the mortgage rate so it's kind of like investing because there's a lot of real estate companies or real estate that can be affected by the stock market so we're trying to see how risky is this type of investment can this lead to an increase in the more in the interest rates which would increase mortgage rates, which would make people more, which would make property more expensive because you'd be paying more in interest over time. Or is it not as risky where it doesn't affect the interest rate in a negative way? Because let's say you bought a home for $250,000 at a 3% interest rate, right? If you purchase the same property five years later, same price, at a 4% interest rate, you're more likely to spend about $10,000 more in interest. So each of these things are crucial and important to your business, to your real estate. So all of these things we have to be aware of. And that has to be in our minds each time that we make a decision, right? Each of these decisions are influenced by things that we usually don't care about or wouldn't think would be of influence to us. So we have to keep that in mind. Now, when we look at capital markets, right, which is the actual investment in the stock market, like I was mentioning, there are four different types of ways. So in private, which is usually between one or two owners and a couple of individuals, right? You have your individuals, you have your partnerships, you have your corporations, those that are buying smaller, you know, usually one unit, two unit, three units, right? Just to own it. Usually when you purchase, if you're a small, individual or a small business, when you're looking to purchase real estate, you go through a bank, you go through insurance companies, you go through a private lender, or you go through a finance company. Those are your only options to purchase real estate. But now if we're talking to public, right, where we have these large companies that are owned by individual investors, right, we call those real estate investment trusts or real estate operating companies, where you have people that have capability of raising large amounts of money, millions and billions of dollars to purchase as many properties as they can, right? They're purchasing large amounts at once and they're backed by securities and they're backed by mortgage investment trust. So they have opportunities to gain way more capital from the beginning and be backed by larger businesses that have billions and billions of dollars in reserves. So if you are trying to gain equity, which means you're the owner, you're what we call an equity participant. The debt participant is those who are actually participating in you accumulating that debt. So they're getting paid off of you trying to get equity those are what we call lenders so if i if you hear of a lender it's someone who's willing to give out money to help people purchase because it becomes their debt and they get paid back from their debt if that makes sense so 
in the public, obviously, because it's open to everyone. You have many buyers and sellers. The prices are there for everyone to see. It's very liquid, which means you can buy it for an hour and then sell it again. It's very fluid. And it's small amounts of ownership that are traded in the public. So what I mean by that is when we are part of the public market for part of a real estate investment trust, I can necessarily own a large amount of it, but the average person could put in, let's say, a hundred bucks and own one share or two shares or 10 shares, which then again comes around and ends up being maybe a fifth, you know, one one thousandth of a percent of ownership but that still means they own a piece of the property so they're gaining in the actual capability of making money from it i mean it may not be much compared to one who owns a hundred thousand shares which turns out to be 50 percent but they're still an owner which means they still can help make decisions for the business Right, so in the public, there's no centralized market, there's no price list, there is no, you know, physical proof of what homes they're buying. They just know that their homes are being purchased. And there really isn't much transparency. Because you don't know, you don't know how long the project takes, you don't know exactly what's going on. So all of it, could be traded in one transaction, right? So you're, you're, you know, you're, you become vulnerable, and there's a higher chance of transaction costs, right? So the property market is the market for ownership for real estate assets, right? Which means that we are paying to receive the rights to potentially rent for cash flow, right? And the demand is for those who want to sell right and in the property market right which is property management you know kind of similar to finance where you could be a company that manages property you manage a hundred thousand units or five units or one unit so this means that the market for it itself is actually integrated. That means that you can be anywhere in the world and buy property. So I can be in China and buy property in Florida today, tomorrow, next year. This is not really a hindrance on where to buy and how to buy. You just need to make sure that there is actual availability for what you want. Right? So there's a huge difference, as we've kind of heard, between the real world, which is what we live in, things that we can see, compared to the financial world, which is things that we're kind of taking without visual. So we're kind of going in what we call blind, right? So in the real world, we have supply and we have demand. They all fluctuate up and down, which comes up with a rental rate. And then that comes into property cash flow, which leads to our value. In our financial world, we're just using money that we saved and we're looking at opportunities. And the variation of those and the fluidity of that goes into our investment return, which is, if, is that below our required return so that it has created value? Or if that's below, it has not created value. So these are the things that we are consistently looking for in both sides of the market. Now, there is no hindrance on what side of the market you could actually be in. It's just what do you choose to be in? All right. So that is the chapter one in itself. Um, you can dive in in chapter two to finish or you guys can take a five minute break. Which do you prefer?
nothing means you guys want to continue so you can finish for the day. I'm going to go with that. So I will load the PowerPoints are going to be loaded today as well as the actual presentation. Um, I'm going to work on figuring out why I can't share the screen in the actual Teams meeting, which has never happened to me before. I've used Teams plenty of times before as well. So I'll figure that out before next Monday, but go into the second part really quickly and we will go from there. So I will load up part two. All right, so chapter two is our legal foundations, which is how we actually make things happen. What rules do we have to follow here? Right, so it's a natural lead in into our bundle of rights. So is this going to explain the rights that you have as a property owner? Difference between real and. Rights are claims that the government is obligated to enforce. Which is coming from the Constitution. And it's different from just raw assumed power. And one word that I want you guys to remember is what we call non revocable, which means it can't be given away. The only thing it can be done is be reduced in the interest of health, safety, and welfare. And another word to remember is enduring. It's not limited to the memory of owners of others, and it cannot be nullified by other citizens or by the government. Nobody has the power to do that. It can only limit if we feel like there's a safety issue. Now, there is a huge difference between personal rights and property rights. Personal rights are individual freedoms that were guaranteed by the Constitution. And these are also interpreted by the Supreme Court, which is the main court system of the United States. So that's personally property rights. You have you have exclusive possession, which means you can include others in the ownership of that property, but you can prove that you own it. And it's for the enjoyment of the use of benefit of yours. So you can if it's farmland, you can harvest and sell. If it's not if you're not living on the property, you can collect rent. If you own it, you can use it however you want within the means of local, right, of local and national rules. And you can have the freedom of disposal whenever you feel like. So you can sell it, you can convert it, you can rebuild it. You can update it. You have those rights because that property is yours. You pay taxes on it. You bought it. So that is available to you. Right. And again, just so we have a refresher from last week, real property are the rights in land and it's permanent structures on, below, and above surface, air, underground. And then personal property, everything that we can move and take with us. Right, so personal rights, if you want to go deeper, freedom of expression, no unlawful search or seizure, protection of life, liberty, and property, no seizing of property without compensation, speedy public fair trial, then our property rights is patents, stocks, bonds, real property, commercial buildings, homes, utilities, Residence, airport. 
religious buildings like churches, streets, roads, bridges, software, patents, and copyrights. So those are our properties that we have the rights to actually have. So you have buildings that here, you know, the MetLife building in New York or the Sears Tower, those are built on air rights, which means you can purchase to go a certain height above what people are usually used to seeing, but that's because it was purchased. So you have the ability to purchase a variety of different things in a variety of different ways to actually fully own property. All right, then you have the fixture. So that's real property that formerly was personal property. So that could be church pews, furniture, custom, you know, screens or windows, but they can't be moved. So it, these are figures on how they've actually been attached. And then it's also about the intention and the relation. So the intention means that, you know, kitchen appliances in a residence compared to apartment. If you're in an apartment, you're more likely to change your appliances. In a home, you're not going to do that as much because you expect it to not move. And then those types of things. So it's all about intention and use. That's what's most important, if that makes sense. So you want to be able to use the property in the right way. So if you're actually going you're using it, it doesn't happen. And why are we caring about how fixtures are? Because the fixtures automatically come with the property. So we consider them things that work. You have to be careful to identify them. And you should be able to say, hey, and confidently say, hey, this is staying with the property, and this is not. When we're, when I'm selling homes, or going to visit a home that's on the market, we know because they tell us what things are actually stained. Washer and dryer, you know, bed, appliances, all those things are literally stated in plain sight so that we know what's staying and what's going. So remember last week we mentioned, I mentioned briefly, about easements, right? That's what we call an interest. A real estate, a real property interest is any bundle of rights that are naturally given in the property, right? The city can put in a bridge, they can put in a well, they can put in like a covering to public property. And you have to just, if you want, if you want the property, you, just have, you can't take it down because that's the city dealing and they're the ones who are responsible for it. So these are things that you have interest in, but you can't necessarily take off the property because the city did it. Mm -hmm. Or you have liens like that you have to pay every year that, that the city has like property taxes. You can't avoid paying property taxes no matter what. And then here we also have what we call estates which is a blanket word that covers everything that someone has before they pass away. And what happens after, if, you know, someone passes away? Where does that property go? Who owns it? What, it? what happens to the rest of their wealth? So usually in that estate, that's where everything comes. And then we have freehold estates, right? Which is a few things. It's estates that don't have a defined length of ownership time. It could either 
contain all possible rights, or it could be certain rights that are revocable, which means we can take back as a condition is violated. Right? So you'll see this a lot with, you know, life insurance, or, you know, let's say that you own property, but if you, you know, you have the potential to own property or gain money, but if you get arrested, it goes away. It goes to the next person. So there are a variety of different options and opportunities that you have here to own things. You just have to understand what they are, how they work, and are there conditions attached or it's until I pass away as well. Right? So we also have what we call a a modern leasehold interest, which means that Let's say I want to live at the property, but I don't want to own it. I can be written and agreed upon as a tenant for a certain amount of time, from a few days to decades. And if it is in writing, which we pretty much live by here, if it's not in writing, it doesn't do anything. It has to be in writing that time, no matter what happens. Or you can do periodic. Periodic is just a handshake and a conversation. You know, there's no defined length of time. And let's say you want to end this agreement or this tenancy. If you pay for six months, it's assumed you need half that time to terminate. So if you pay for six months, you need three months to leave. 30 days, 15 days. And modern lease, the modern leasehold has been derived from rural society. So this is usually you'll see in states like Florida, North Dakota, Nebraska, those that have a lot of farmland or very spread out. And a lot of times before they became modernized to this times today. They didn't have the necessities needed to actually fully establish a real contract. So they didn't have knowledge of concepts or what was done before time when these things were, when these situations were coming up. Right, so You know, we have our easements, which is called a non-possessory interest. That's also a lien or what we call restricted covenant. Easements, like I said, it's the right to use land for a specific reason. And it's only for a period of time. Usually it's standards like 20 years. And that could be as like, you know, a creek of water that flows out of the back of someone's home or a gas line that the city uses that's on someone's property. They build the protection. If something happens, they're responsible for it. Right? Then you have, in an easement, what we call a right of use. So it just means that a specific spot of land where it's located has I wouldn't say power, but it has preference over an adjacent parcel, right? So that's what we call a driveway, a sewer line, a drainage, a common wall, right? And the rights and obligations are inseparable from the actual parcels. So I can't sell the property and then sell the rights. The rights come naturally with the property. They, they have to be together. No matter what people think, it has to be together. Right. So in what we call commercial, right, our warehouses, retail properties, there's also easements. But they're called easements and gross. 
So you have the right to use the land to either build a roadway, put down a power a power line cable or pipeline, run a ditch for irrigation, put up billboards, harvest timbers, you know, save wetlands, hunt, fish, get minerals for oil and gas. In commercial, it is actually separate with the land. So I can purchase the land while somebody else owns the rights to do everything else. Or I can just literally ask to do both at the same time. So there isn't there is the capability of buying both, but there's also a chance that they're owned by more than one person. But in commercial, since it's more space, more opportunity, it's a little bit more expensive. Right. So a lot of times with these easements, you need to have permission rather than a right. But you could also have an exclusive right, which is everything. Or again, non-exclusive, which is just one person. Right. And in an exclusive, I can extend these rights to a sibling, a, a child, a spouse, a cousin, a, you know, any other family member, another person, right? Business partner, whatever it may be. I can extend all of those things. I can make all of those happen and share the rights that I Hello. Is it his connection? Hello? I don't know. I don't I also don't have their voice. Oh, I think um the instructor gun. Uh, he has not done with the issues like this. Uh, guys, uh, for real estate, we have another roster group, yes? Excuse me? For real estate, uh, do you have another uh, WhatsApp group or no? It is just in the main group. No, it's just the main group. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, guys, so it's since it's all it's only as here. Should shouldn't we make a group? All uh, only students, so we can. Good add, idea. Uh, a chat group, yes? Yes, I, I think that's a good idea. It, it will be useful for our, all of us. Yeah, okay. So I will try to uh, create a group so if you guys agree. But I think, yeah, it's a good idea. How about others? Valentin, Sarah, Winnie? Yeah, that's a good idea. Good idea. Okay. So for now, Demo, should we contact uh, the teacher so that he, I mean, uh, so that we figure out what's happening to him? 
Should we contact the teacher? Um, no, here we can. And just to ask, do we have any notes for this unit? Um, he said he will share the slides, so uh, we will have to wait for him. Oh, OK, OK. Yes, and uh, we can have the videos from uh, YouTube. Um, they shared the link on the group, so you can access that. Ah, thanks. Uh, guys, uh, do you all have the resources for this class? I mean, about the book. Professor texted. I think he'll be back soon. Guys? Gemma, right? Yep. Uh, I said yep. that, uh, do you all have uh, the book of this class? I mean, real estate? No, we don't. Uh, he said that he'll provide it. Uh, he, find it or something. he said that he'll share it. You mean that uh, still he didn't share the book, yes? Book and the no, he resource. Did not share the book. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nothing How about the uh, last presentations, previous pr presentations? Um, there's nothing posted on the platform, so I think we will ask the teacher. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think so. Uh, and how about the yesterday's uh, quiz? Uh, I didn't get the yesterday's quiz. Uh, and did you get that? Yes. Um, not, but... Yes. So uh, you should go uh, check your on your calendar. And I searched a lot, but I couldn't uh, find. Um, if you're using your cell phone, use your computer. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I think there's a difference. Uh huh. Yeah. So I think there's a difference while you're using your phone and using your PC. We are using cell phone. When I access the platform, my cell phone. Um, I don't see anything. I don't see any activities on the calendar. So, um, oh. yeah, that's why cell phone it is not possible. Yeah, awesome. so you should, oh. yeah, so you should go ahead and check it on your computer if you have one. Okay. How's the weather? Uh, hello, guys. Uh, do you have an idea about the case study assignment of HR class? Mm, I don't know. Yeah, no clue. So, yeah. I'm planning on reading about it today. So, yeah. Oh, it's just so confusing. Uh, he just Give us some uh, titles of case studies, but there are no case studies, and we we do not have access to the uh, textbook. Yes, uh, I'm not good. Uh, uh, case study. I texted the uh, instructor, HR instructor. So let me. Uh, See if you respond. If she responds, then I can share it with you guys. Okay, thank you.
Guys, uh, the teacher shared a new link and uh, the student affairs said that uh, joined the new link. Are you there? Hello? Yes, sir. Is it shared on the WhatsApp group? Yes, yes. Let's go. Okay. Bye bye. Are we done with this class? They have changed the link uh, in WhatsApp. You can check your WhatsApp. The, we are sharing a new link to rejoin the class. <laughs> 